Uh, hello class. Um, so this is lecture two. We're going to cover chemistry of the cell. Um, now all of you have taken organic chemistry. It's a prerequisite for the course and some of you are in currently enrolled um, in biochemistry or you have taken biochemistry either 403 and 404 with Dr. Khan or, um, or 304 I believe is the other biochemistry lecture um, so, or course. Um, and so this uh, subject matter is actually pretty important for everything that we do in the course. And this lecture is mainly set up to be a review of that. And so if you guys aren't all that familiar with biochemistry, I suggest that you um, sort of review this lecture very closely and do the reading in the book. Remember, this is a course on cell biology and biochemistry is an important part of that but you can probably get through if you haven't taken biochemistry. Just make sure that you understand a lot of what's going on here. Um, okay, so to just begin, uh, we saw last time that, that cells actually have a lot of different compartments, the ER, the Golgi, and these compartments help segregate chemical reactions, right? And in its most basic form, you can sort of think of it as in the cytoplasm, that's a reducing environment. Okay, it's, it's very hard for certain bonds to form um, versus the ER, which is actually an oxidizing environment. And we'll learn more about this uh, later, especially when we're covering um, transport through the ER and the Golgi. Um, but one of the things that you guys really need to know for the course are redox reactions. Um, and these are essential for life. And redox is just short for oxidation reduction or reduction oxidation reactions. And we'll see some examples of these um, later on. They become very important um, for a whole bunch of different processes. Um, now, when it comes to chemistry of the cell, the cell is predominantly composed of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. But there's also a whole bunch of other essential um, um, elements like calcium, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, zinc, copper, iron, and magnesium. And I'm sure you guys can all think of different uh, aspects of the cell that, that sort of use these different elements. Uh, you, I'm sure you're all familiar with the sodium-potassium pump. Calcium is also a, a small signaling molecule um, that uh, is stored in the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, we all know about where phosphorus is used. Um, it's actually used in ATP and in DNA, uh, as well as um, oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and the phosphate group, which we'll see in a second, is uh, used in signaling. Um, there's also a bunch of others, sulfur, zinc, copper, iron, and magnesium. And in the case with zinc, I'm sure you guys have all heard of zinc, uh, Zinc fingers, these are transcription factors. Both copper and iron are very important in the electron transport chain, which is uh, used for oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and so these guys are great at, at sort of shuttling electrons around. Um, also, iron is used in hemoglobin and myoglobin to sort of uh, shuttle around oxygen. And if any of you guys have ever set up a PCR reaction using TAC polymerase, um, in one of your laboratory courses, the buffer actually contains magnesium because magnesium is contained in the active site of pretty much all polymerases, and we'll see that when we're, when we're covering DNA replication. Um, so here's just another way to sort of look at the elements in a cell. Uh, they're color-coded here, um, and 70% of the cell is water. Um, and if you take out the water, the relative amount of the other elements become a lot more prominent. Um, and so if you compare the human body to the Earth's crust, you can see we're very enriched in hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, and a lot less of the others. Um, whereas in the Earth's crust, uh, some of these other elements like aluminum, silica, um, oxygen, calcium, um, and sodium are much more prevalent. And the take home message here is that it actually takes a lot of energy to contain to maintain this ordered state where you have mostly hydrogen, carbon, and, and oxygen, um, and nitrogen in the cell, and, and we'll see that later on. Um, so if we look at some of the different elements in a cell, iron sulfur um, 
is a pretty minor component uh, when you sort of factor in the amount um, of iron and sulfur within a cell, but it's actually a major player. Okay, this is uh, just a, an EM of mitochondria. We saw this uh, last time. And the iron sulfur clusters are very important for cellular metabolism. Um, the, there's two different, main, two main types of iron sulfur cluster, two iron, two sulfur, or four iron, four sulfur. And these are integral components of electron transfer or oxidative phosphorylation that actually happens in the mitochondria. Um, but they're also contained in the catalytic centers of other proteins as well. Um, and iron is great at moving electrons because it, it can exist in a plus two or plus three state. Now, one of the interesting things about iron is that it's insoluble um, and it's also toxic, right? So cells actually go to great lengths to acquire the appropriate amount of iron and regulate how much is around, right? Because if you have too much iron, it becomes toxic and if not enough, um, it makes it that much more difficult to survive. Um, and I already sort of answered this question earlier, but can you think of other um, molecules in mammals that require iron? And two great examples are hemoglobin and myoglobin, which are involved in sort of shuttling oxygen around. Um, so here's just some of the chemistry of some of the major elements, um, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. And you guys should have all had this in organic chemistry. Oxygen can form two bonds, nitrogen can form three, and carbon forms um, four. And these are sort of, it's, it's important for, that you guys sort of understand um, sort of the chemical properties of these because they become very important in cell biology. And part of the reason is because of dipoles, right? And here's just a simple um, dipole and dipole moment with, with water. And so you can see that it has an, a net positive charge on one side and a net negative charge on the other. And so if you have a positively charged ion in the cell, it can get surrounded by water in this fashion versus a negatively charged ion um, will associate with water in this sort of fashion where the hydrogens are, are sort of surrounding the, the negative charged um, ion. Um, okay, and so some of the other things that you really need to know are co covalent versus non-covalent bonds. Okay, these are very important in a cell. A covalent bond you can sort of think of uh, as being sort of tight, okay? It's, it's tightly associated, requires a lot of energy um, to be broken, um, and they tend to be a lot shorter versus hydrogen bonds, which are much further apart, um, and you have a donor arm and an acceptor arm in hydrogen bonding, okay? And these become important in everything from the way proteins fold to the way DNA and RNA associate with one another, um, and we'll see that in a second. Okay, but here are just some of the um, hydrogen bonds that can exist in the cell where you have a donor arm and an acceptor arm, and the donor arm will always have the, the hydrogen on it, okay? Um, and these just are very, very important for non-covalent interactions and, and, you know, covalent bonds in, in polypeptides and in nucleic acids are very important to hold them together, like the phosphodiester bond, whereas, you know, the anti-parallel beta sheets uh, rely on, or the anti-parallel um, DNA uh, requires the hydrogen bonding. And we'll see this um, in the next slide. Okay, so as you guys all know, um, DNA is double-stranded, and it's actually held together by the hydrogen bonds. So uh, A and T base pair together and share two hydrogen bonds, where G and C um, actually have three hydrogen bonds, okay? And um, you always have a purine base pairing with a pyrimidine um, in DNA. Now, some of the things you need to know about DNA, and we'll cover this more, is it's anti-parallel. Okay, it runs basically three prime to five prime, and then three prime to five prime in the other direction. Um, you have the phosphate group um, as the backbone and the phosphodiester bonds that connect the different bases together. 
Um, what's a little interesting here and in, in just some history, so um, Watson and Crick actually uh, sort of stole Rosalind Franklin's X-ray crystal data, and we'll see this later on when we're looking closer at the structure of DNA. Um, and from what they could tell from her X-ray data was that the DNA was likely helical, um, but they had to figure out how it all came together. And it was this base pairing and the hydrogen bonding that existed between the bases um, that was the real key breakthrough in the solution of it. Now, Rosalind Franklin had also proposed that the phosphate backbone um, must be on the outside uh, because of its net negative charge, uh, because that would sort of repel if it was tried to be forced on the inside. Um, and as we'll see when we start to cover chromatin, which, we, which I introduced um, last lecture, the, the histones in chromatin actually help to neutralize this net negative charge that comes from DNA. Um, but it's really important for you guys to understand the directionality of DNA from three prime to five prime. And I take this very seriously. And it seems like everybody in the class always will lose points on exams for not d doing this properly and keeping track of the five prime and three prime DNA. Um, and you don't necessarily have to appreciate the numbers, but here they are. You have your number one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, and that gets, um, has a phosphodiester linkage here, and then your four carbon, and then your five carbon, where the other phosphate comes off of. Okay, so once again, um, the directionality of DNA is super important, um, and there'll be a lot of questions throughout the course of the term, so you guys might as well appreciate um, that now. Okay. Um, ionic and hydrophobic interactions also come into play with proteins. Okay, um, we we have the hydrogen bonding in DNA, but when it comes to proteins and forming large protein complexes, um, ionic and hydrophobic interactions um, come to play as well. And so you can have uh, between two proteins. In this case, they're showing uh, protein A and protein B which can form a stable complex. You have hydrogen bonding, and then you have ionic interactions, um, more hydrogen bonding, and then you can have these hydrophobic um, van der Waals interaction, which can help bring the protein together. Um, and these are also very important in protein folding, not only holding two proteins together in a complex, but also in protein folding. We'll look at that next, um, next lecture. Um, and so the numbers of these sort of hydrogen bonding and ionic bonds and hydrophobic interactions will actually dictate how stable a protein complex is. So the more of these that are available and the better fit that they have, um, the tighter the interaction will be versus a less stable con um, complex which will have m fewer interactions to hold them together. Okay. Um, and I have a little thing here, um, what is hydrophobic? I'm assuming you guys have all had had this at some point in time, um, but if you want the derivative of the word, um, hydrophobic actually I think comes from Latin, um, where hydro is water and phobic is fearing, so it's, it's water fearing. Um, it just doesn't like water, and water is always displaced um, out of these sort of hydrophobic interactions. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go on to talk about uh, various um, uh, groups um, that are actually used uh, in a cell quite regularly. Okay, so there's the methyl group. Um, and the methyl group is actually added to proteins, DNA, and RNA. Um, it can also be removed. Um, it plays sort of an important role in gene regulation and chromatin regulation. I'm sure some of you guys have heard of um, DNA methylation, uh, but RNA can also get methylated. Um, and histones can get methylated uh, within the cell, um, but also um, the methyl group can get added also in the cytoplasm and other places. So it's just this really super important group that gets added and subtracted from proteins during all kinds of various chemical reactions. Um, there's also the phosphate group, and we've already sort of seen this, um, and the phosphodiester bond, which is right here, between here and here, actually um, 
connects nucleotides in DNA and RNA. And once again, there's a directionality here, three prime to five prime, and you can count out the carbons. Um, and this actually, this um, sort of association with phosphate to um, nucleotides in DNA actually gives it the directionality. Okay, so three prime to five prime. Um, phosphate's also ubiquitous mo a ubiquitous modification that's added to proteins. Um, one of the most prevalent examples of it um, is the phosphate group that's added to proteins by kinases um, in cell signaling. And that can be reversed by phosphatases that actually remove the phosphate group. Okay, so here's just a, um, an example of phosphate getting added to an R group. Um, another place where phosphate's used is in ATP, okay? You can have the phosphates, um, uh, specifically the gamma phosphate in ATP, is a huge energy store, and we'll look at that later on in the lecture here. Um, but you can also um, have pyrophosphate uh, released when you're synthesizing RNA or DNA, um, and we'll look at that later as well. Um, you also have the acetyl group, um, and this is actually a, um, an important modification to proteins um, as well as coenzymes, okay? So we, I'm sure you guys have all heard of um, acetyl coenzyme A, which is very important in central metabolism. Um, but acetylation is also very important in gene regulation, okay? And not only do transcription factors get acetylated, but also histones get this modification, um, and that actually helps uh, transcriptional regulation. And just for some more historical context in all of this, there's this protein in cells called GCN5, okay? And um, it was discovered by this guy by the name of David Ellis. Well, it wasn't discovered by him. It was long known that GCN5 was actually a, uh, involved in transcriptional regulation, but it didn't have any kind of DNA binding domain or anything like that. And for decades they were trying to figure out what this enzyme GCN5 does to sort of assist in gene regulation. Um, and this guy, David Ellis, who's now over at Rockefeller, um, what he ended up doing was figuring out that um, GCN5 is actually a histone acetyltransferase and it can add, um, it can add the acetyl group to um, proteins, okay? specifically histones, which um, assists in their gene regulation. Okay, some other prominent uh, things in the cell are sugars and polysaccharides. Um, and these are mainly used um, in glycolysis, right? We use sugar as a, as a food source. But sugars are also added to proteins in the secretory pathway. Okay, um, and what that and that's called glycosylation, and we'll cover that sort of at the end of the term. Um, but one important thing that you guys have to know about sugars, um, as well as just other chemical reactions in the cell, is that you they oftentimes undergo two different reactions. Okay, a condensation reaction where water is expelled, um, and then you can go from sort of a monosaccharide to a disaccharide or polysaccharides if you add a whole bunch of them. And then when you want to break them apart, you do um, hydrolysis, okay? And in hydrolysis, a water molecule is actually consumed um, and gets added to the protein. So condensation, water is expelled, um, and in hydrolysis, water is consumed. And we'll see some examples of this coming up in, in the next few slides. Um, Okay, another really important component of cells are phospholipids, okay? These make up the lipid bilayer. Um, and we saw these uh, yesterday in the Harvard video or last lecture in the Harvard video uh, where you basically have these um, sort of lipid bilayer, okay? And one of the things about lipids, as we'll see later on in the, in the course, is that they're amphiphilic. They're both hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Okay, so you have a hydrophilic head group and a hydrophobic tail section. And the way these things are set up, they're only energetically favorable if they're laid out in this sort of um, lipid bilayer uh, where you have these two leaflets that come together. 
okay? And this is what really helps sort of compartmentalize a cell, right? It's not only does it represent the um, outer cell membrane, but uh, you have a lipid bilayer separating the ER uh, from the cytoplasm and the Golgi from the cytoplasm. Um, and so you can also have integral membrane proteins uh, that are contained there and peripheral membrane proteins. And then, as I mentioned before, certain proteins in the secretory pathway get glycosylated, so they get these, hydro, um, these carbohydrates uh, added to them, okay? And that makes them uh, glycoproteins. Um, and this particular phospholipid, phosphatidyl, phosphatidylcholine, is actually enriched in lipid rafts along with cholesterol, okay? And so here's just uh, what cholesterol looks like the chemical structure of it. Um, now, cholesterol is actually circulating throughout our body in sort of low-density lipoprotein, um, but the majority of cholesterol is actually made in the ER, um, and it becomes part of the lipid bilayer, okay? And so if you have high cholesterol circulating through your body, chances are you have a mutation in this protein called the LDL receptor. And we'll cover this later when we look at LDL trafficking. Um, but some people who have high cholesterol, they're actually taking um, these things called statins, okay? And the statins um, actually inhibit this enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase, okay? That's the target of statins. And here's sort of a, um, a cartoon image of, of what HMG-CoA reductase is. Um, and this is the rate-limiting enzyme in uh, cholesterol synthesis. And so by inhibiting it, you can actually lower people's cholesterol. Um, and if you're like me and you have a mutation in your LDL receptor and you love five guys, then you're basically going to be on statins. Okay. Um, okay, so the amino acids. Uh, now, you guys should all sort of memorize these, especially the graduate student. Um, because it's just so important. I'm not going to hold you to memorize them all. Like, I won't give you a question on an exam. Please, um, you know, draw out all the 20 essential amino acids, um, you know, but it, it's important that you guys do know them because specific amino acids have specific functions and are important for different things. Um, like serine, threonine, and tyrosine, they can all get a phosphate added to them and that becomes important in, in cell signaling. Um, but in general, to make your life easy on learning the amino acids, the amino acids are all broken down into sort of a, a similar sort of structure, okay? You have your amino group on one end and a carboxyl group on the other, and then you have a variable group that comes off the C-alpha carbon. Okay, so this is your C-alpha carbon right here um, in proteins or in amino acids. Um, and if you look down here at the chart, uh, the R groups are all sort of shaded here so that you can see the various ones. Um, and the amino acids are actually broken down into different um, categories. All right, you have your nonpolar or the non-charged hydrophobic. Um, amino acids, so these will be involved in van der Waals uh, and hydrophobic hydrophobic interactions. You have your polar um, amino acids um, or the non charged hydrophilic amino acids. These will oftentimes have an OH or an SH or um, a, a free amine uh, to go from. And then there's electrically charged amino acids that are broken down into either acidic. So those will have a, um, a carboxylic acid group on the end of them or a basic group um, where, you, where you'll have a free amine on the end of them. So lysine, arginine, um, or histidine versus aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Um, and so once again, uh, you know, I'm never gonna ask you guys to draw a specific amino acid, but you really should memorize these and know these. Um, I sort of chalk them up to, you know, this is nitty gritty details, um, but really you should understand some of the big things, especially the difference between the acidic ones and the basic ones and some of the ones with OH groups on the end 
uh, like serine, threonine. And cysteine is a special case. It forms disulfides, which we'll cover when we get to um, the secretory pathway later in the term. And another important one you guys should all be aware of, um, be aware of is, is proline. Um, proline, the uh, side chain on the coming off the C alpha carbon is actually attached to the amino terminal end of the protein as well. And when this comes to folding, it can oftentimes create a kink um, in like an alpha helix and break the break the continuation of an alpha helix. And we'll look at that uh, next time when we're talking about protein folding. Okay, so amino acids actually make, um, or, or proteins and, um, and polypeptides are actually composed of uh, amino acids. Okay, and the amino acids are actually assembled on the ribosome. And we saw this last uh, time, last lecture, uh, how the ribosome sort of functions, and we'll cover that in much greater detail later on. Um, but what you end up having here is what's called a peptide bond, where you have the amino terminal end of one amino acid joined to the carboxy terminal end of another um, amino acid. Okay, and just like DNA, uh, proteins are directional. You have a C-terminal end of a polypeptide um, and an N-terminal end, okay? So the amino terminal end and the carboxy terminal end, okay? Um, and this bond right here, which you all should know, is um, the peptide bond. And when this is formed um, on the ribosome, it's done by uh, the um, peptidyl transferase uh, in the ribosome itself, okay? Another important thing in cells are, are nucleotides, okay? And besides for being the major constituents of DNA and RNA, nucleotides are also good energy carriers, okay? So we've all seen um, in previous courses, I'm sure, how ATP is one of the major energy stores in the cell. Um, and there's also plenty of GTP around, and uh, GTP can be used for a couple of things. It can be used as an energy store, um, and it can also be used um, in cell signaling, okay? And when we cover cell signaling, and we'll see a whole bunch of um, different, what are called G proteins, um, that's involved in a whole bunch of different cellular processes, okay? So GTP and G proteins are very important in regulating different aspects of the cell from sort of translation on the ribosome to, uh, you know, cell signaling with G protein coupled receptors. Um, we'll also see G proteins come into play uh, in the secretory pathway, both when secretory vesicles are formed and when they fuse, okay? Um, and ATP and GTP are mainly synthesized in the mitochondria. Okay, that's just an important little thing. And, and we'll start at the end of this lecture to look a little bit at um, oxidative phosphorylation, um, at least in the um, part two of lecture one. Okay, so I'm sure you guys have all seen this. Oftentimes, if you ever walk through a chemistry department, you'll see a big uh, poster with all of the different biochemical pathways here. And it just goes to show you all of the sort of interconnected circuits that are involved in cellular metabolism and all of the different um, biochemical reactions that are happening. Um, and what's interesting about this, and we'll cover it a little bit, not too much in this course, but all of the cellular metabolism, a lot of it is governed by our circadian clock. This is uh, one of the major regulators of metabolism. And what it does, what the clock does is actually regulate key regulatory enzymes. It regulates the transcription of key regulatory enzymes in this process. And by controlling that, you can control the time of day when metabolism is mainly active. And you guys can sort of think about this as, you know, we sleep at night, um, and you know, when we wake up in the morning, one of the first things we do is have breakfast, um, and that sort of kicks on our met metabolism, and we're generating ATP all day long to to, to sort of generate and um, energy. Um, and one other thing that you need to know is there's oftentimes a lot of feedback between these different enzymes, and we'll sort of look at that. Um, 
later on how the buildup of certain byproducts uh, can slow reactions um, or speed up reactions depending on where they are. Okay, another thing that you guys need to sort of know, um, and I'm sure you've all had it, is, is basic thermodynamics. Okay, in particular, entropy versus enthalpy. Okay, now, entropy is sort of a measure of disorder, okay? And the greater the disorder, the greater the entropy. Whereas enthalpy is actually a measure of the total energy in a system. Okay, and if we go through the uh, three laws of thermodynamics, the first law states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be transferred. Okay, so, you know, cell, cells have to take in foodstuffs um, to generate energy, and then it's transferred oftentimes to like ATP, um, and then it can be used in various chemical reactions. Um, the second law of thermodynamics states that all systems tend toward equilibrium or otherwise known as the maximum state of entropy, okay, which is completely disordered. Um, and the third law of thermodynamics, at absolute zero, um, zero Kelvin, a system approaches zero enthalpy, entropy, which is completely ordered, okay. So the take home message here is that all biological systems require energy to maintain an ordered state. Um, and your book uses this little example of, of this boy um, sort of studying at his desk, and as time elapses and he gets bored with studying, he's going to start playing with all his toys and not putting them away, and it just becomes disordered, okay? And then it takes energy to actually, and some effort, to clean his room back up and get it organized again. Um, and so when I was in graduate school, uh, one of the professors basically explained it this way. Um, when you die, you have increasing entropy, right? You become increasingly disordered um, as your body starts to decompose. And without any energy to put into it to reorder it, um, you just have increasing entropy. So then the question does, well, where does all the energy for life come from? Okay. And I'm sure you guys all know the answer to this. It's actually photosynthesis, right? It all comes from the sun. Okay, so photosynthesis uh, can basically take um, water and CO2 and you put energy in um, and that actually will convert into oxygen and sugars. Okay, so you get light energy, water, and CO2 coming in, it releases oxygen and then the, the carbon and CO2 can actually be converted to sugar and other organic molecules, okay? And then most other living organisms will either take and eat the plants and algae and, and some bacteria and will basically break down the sugars into CO2 and H2O and consume oxygen in the, in the process, okay? And this can then be used for useful chemical energy and organization of a cell. So pretty much all life on Earth um, derives its energy from the sun, but there is exceptions to the rule. And I normally, if we weren't remote, I would ask you guys, do you, do you know um, the exception to the rule? And the exception is actually organisms that live deep at the bottom of the ocean where no sunlight gets. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Um, and these use geochemical energy and inorganic raw materials um, to derive their energy. And then you can actually get multicellular organisms. Here's a nice little picture, the bottom of the ocean where there is no sunlight um, and they can live on, uh, the bacteria that are down there can live on um, hydrogen sulfide coming from uh, volcanic eruptions at the bottom of the ocean. Um, okay, so now on to uh, catalysis and activation enzymes, okay? so. To maintain an ordered state with really low entropy, a cell needs energy, okay? And it needs chemical reactions. And enzymes uh, are there to sort of help out, okay? And enzymes don't change the amount of energy that's required. Um, it just lowers the activation energy. So the net result um, is the energy is the same from a reactant to a product and you can see it both here, but the activation energy from 
the enzyme actually gets lowered. So it's easier for this reactant to become this product, okay? Um, and that's basically all that enzymes do. They lower the activation energy for normally unfavorable reactions. And here's kind of how it works. You have an enzyme and a substrate, and the enzyme will actually bind the substrate, um, and the enzyme substrate complex then undergoes catalysis. Then you have your enzyme product, the enzyme's released, and you're left with your product. Okay, so once again, enzymes lower the activation energy, um, and they do this by sort of the unique chemical properties that are present in the active site of the enzyme. Um, and it's typically the active site where the enzymes bind their substrate. And these electrochemical properties lower the activation enzymes. And we'll see specific examples of these later on in the term. But as a general rule, you guys need to sort of um, just sort of a appreciate this. It doesn't change the overall energy for the reaction, it just lowers the activation energy. Um, and cells actually couple reactions um, to do create useful work. Okay, so there's these things called energetically favorable reactions, okay, where delta G is less than zero. Okay, um, and so these reactions will occur spontaneously, right? Y is going to become X because the delta G is less than zero. And so Y will just produce a lot of X and this will occur spontaneously. You also have then energetically unfavorable reactions where X needs to be converted back to Y. So in this case, delta G is greater than zero and it requires energy. And this reaction is only going to occur if it's coupled to a second energetically favorable reaction. And so what you end up getting then are reactions with a negative delta G, which can drive, um, and this would be sort of a spontaneous favorable reaction, and this would drive a, a non-spontaneous unfavorable reaction um, and convert uh, X to Y. And so the cells use this whole coupling of unfavorable reactions to reactions to allow them to proceed. Now, another thing that comes into play is concentration and dynamic equilibrium, okay? Um, now, typically, all enzymatic reactions are reversible, and they depend heavily on the concentration of the substrate, okay? So in this instance, you have Y, um, and it's basically energetically favorable to go to X, okay? Um, uh, and and X will actually go back to Y um, at some level um, because of sort of thermal bombardments and other things like that. And the cell can actually control the level of downstream catalysis by tightly regulating um, the rate limiting enzymes in this whole thing, okay? So um, as well as controlling the concentration of the various reactants and products. Um, okay, so if we start with an equal number of, of X and Y's and the formation of X is favorable, this conversion will occur often, okay? Whereas X will occur, X back to Y will occur less often. And so if you sort of couple these together, what's gonna end up happening is the Y's will go to X until you get to the point where you're at equilibrium and equal number of X's go back to Y, um, and Y and an equal number of Y's go to X's, okay? And so the equilibrium constant in all of this is uh, K, and it's the concentration of X and Y. So I hope that I made that clear to everybody. It's, it's not as difficult as I sort of just made it sound, um, but ultimately, if a favorable reaction is there controlling the amount of product and reactant will actually uh, control the um, reactions, all right? So Y to X is favorable, X to Y is not favorable, and so when you have a lot of it, you'll eventually get to equilibrium where there's fewer Ys um, being driven to X, and there's many more Xs, um, but uh, 
and the rate at which y goes to x is equal to the rate at which x goes to y, even though there's so much more x here. So I hope that made sense, okay? But this becomes very important in um, certain chemical reactions in sort of uh, central metabolism. Um, okay, but once again, enzymes don't actually change the equilibrium constant, okay? Um, what they can do is uh, oftentimes drive a reaction to become a product, okay? So here, because the reactions are additive, okay? So here we have one reaction, x to y, and it's actually more favorable in the back direction. So whenever there's y's, it's actually going to sort of spontaneously form x's, okay? But that's energetically unfavorable for the cell. Um, however, you have um, y to z, and it's much more favorable to form z than y. Okay, so the vast, when you couple these together, y is going to want to become x, but every x that becomes a y is more likely to become a z over here. And so what you're doing is you're getting these sequential reactions set up so that the equilibrium point produces a lot of x from very little or a lot of z from very little x because y is rapidly removed um, from the system. If y was to build up, it would just go back to being x, okay? So these sequential reactions are additive and thus unfavorable reactions um, can be driven by favorable reactions. Um, and so one of the things that helps to do this is that you have stored energy in a cell which actually is used to drive energy. And you can sort of, the example that your book uses is that if you sort of think about um, a rock falling off a cliff, when it hits the bottom, it can break up and it's all, all the energy is dissipated as heat. Um, but you can actually capture that falling rock, um, which is a energetically favorable reaction to do useful work. In this case, it raises a bucket. Okay, and then once the bucket is raised, you can pour the water out um, and you can use that in a hydraulic machine to create useful work. Okay, so, um, so basically kinetic energy can be stored within the cell and this kinetic energy can be used for different processes. And so I'm going to sort of end this part of the lecture asking what are the major sources of energy in a cell. And I'll give you guys a little second to think about that. Um, before I start up the next lecture. Okay, so that's the end of part one, and I will start part two in just a second here.